standing on top of my townhouse, waving a black flag. Ayo! And I swear on my mother, I hear the corresponding, I. For me, storytelling initially came from those observations and wanting to put language to experiences that I couldn't understand. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Arelis Hernandez, a national reporter here at the Washington Post. Today in our Race in America series, we're joined by best-selling author and National Book Award winner, Elizabeth Acevedo, welcome to Washington Post Live. Hello, Relis, how are you? Good, good, thank you so much for, for joining us. I, I was tickled by a number of elements in your story, but let's go ahead and get started. For sure. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about your latest book, because that's that's kind of why we're here, but you've written you know, award-winning books for, for young people now, and Family Lore is your first novel for adults. Why did you want to write this book now? I think that there was a lot I wanted to give voice to um, that felt like it needed to be for a more mature audience. And part of it is how we inherit trauma, how we struggle with um, learning our ancestor stories and our elder stories and how in some ways they struggle to learn about us, particularly if you're from cultures where macalladita te ves más bonita, right? Like, silent, you look prettier, or quietness is coveted. Um, there's a lot that doesn't get said in those gaps, and there's a lot of um, that is lost, I think, in those stories. And so for me, wanting to capture that at this point in my life, especially as, you know, the elders in my family are getting to an age where where they're reaching, you know, their last, their last act, um, wanting to write a book that kind of commemorates oral storytelling and the things we don't say to each other. So you wrote this book in prose, but your previous books delve more into verse and, and slam poetry, which is sort of a part of your story and your background. How was this writing experience different than your previous work? Right. I think that the process was really different in that my audience, I had to constantly remind myself, like, this is an audience that I can challenge in a different way than I would challenge young people, right? And I think it was a lot of fun. I didn't have to play as much of the, oh, is this too far? Am I being hopeful enough? Am I guiding the reader in such a way that um, they won't leave this book with too many questions? I think with this novel, I was okay if people had questions. I kind of trust that folks will do research or they will um, fill in a lot of the gaps that I leave, that they're going on the journey and it is not my job to do as much of the hand-holding that I'm, I'm used to doing. But in many ways, it was very similar. I mean, my, my approach to all of the books is to tell an honest story and to be very tender towards my readers and towards my, my characters. And so although they go through hard things, um, that, that part of the journey didn't change. So this story is one of a Dominican American family. Um, you can tell me how much of it sort of reflects your own upbringing, but it's through the voices of six different women, four of them sisters. Why was this perspective so important for you to resaltar, to, to bring forward? Right. I don't think we have enough stories about 70 year olds and particularly I think in, in the Latine community, in the Dominican community, um, women of that age are relegated to the sideline in the arts, and I wanted to put them front and center. You know, my, my tias are vivacious, they're hilarious, they're particular, they're cantankerous, right? <laughs> like, they have all of this, these multitudes that they contain, and I, I wanted to have this really complicated kind of story that, that honors that part of themselves, that honors aging, right? Um, that 
that it is not something to be afraid of, that there is magic that we can find in every decade of our lives. And, and so this book, I think, really puts to the forefront the lives that these women have lived and the lives they still have to look forward to. So the main plot point in your book is, you know, Flor, who's one of the sisters, we can call her even the matriarch to some degree, is going to receive a living wake. Where did you get this idea from? I know where Flor got the idea from, but where did you get it from? I got it from a very similar place as Flor. Um, I was at in a, a retreat that kind of was like a TED Talk retreat where they would have a lot of different presenters and someone was presenting on anthropological research that they've done, um, looking into the ways that people are dealing with different um, methods of grieving and different methods and rituals of, of burial, right? And one of the ones that was briefly highlighted was a gentleman who was throwing a living wake and the ways that, especially as people deal with perhaps chronic illness, they are being more mindful of how do I say some of those goodbyes and give some of the chances to my families and people who love me to receive closure before I'm actually gone. And so I kind of saw that, tucked it away. And a year later, when I started writing this story, I was like, oh, that would be an interesting framework to, to bring into this family. And what would a Dominican family think about a living wake? And how would they come together or would there be resistance or what would be you know some of the feelings that would come up and um, it was a perfect tension to to kind of kick start this book well and and flor being you know the oldest of the sisters the second born actually uh, of the family in some ways embodies some of this matriarchal deference right like because flor has the magic the other sisters just kind of like Okay, if she says so, then there must be a reason to this, right? So can you describe for me the role of the matriarch in Latino families and, and why like Flor sort of embodies this? Yeah, I think there's a way in which the the matriarch and my mom is one of nine sisters, and I think you can see how they some of the sisters share the role, right? Depending on the subject matter, one is kind of hailed as like, all right, you are the expert of this and we defer to you in this way. Um, and, and this book, it felt important to kind of highlight the ways that leadership, particularly within and amongst women, um, can look like and how it can take place and how it's quiet. And although Florida is not the eldest, she is um, given the deference almost of knowing the most, right? And, and I think that there's something really beautiful in highlighting the ways that they all give her her flowers and give her her respect um, and the ways that she's had to demand it and wield it, right, um, really thoughtfully in order to to allow everyone to kind of share in in the ways that the family functions. One of the things I loved uh, about you explaining sort of your evolution as a writer and, and in this book is that like you, you didn't feel the need to have to explain certain terms or sort of s cultural idioms and you just wrote them in Spanish. You know, people can use Google, right? Like referencing back to this interaction that you had in college with a particular professor, right? Uh, and I'm curious, you know, do you, as, as part of that, these are your Dominican roots that are inspiring your work. I mean, what do you want people to take away from your writing? Do you want them to do the extra research to find out like what that refrain means or what that what she's referring to uh, in a particular place? What do you want from them? I think I try to be really specific in who I assume my reader is. And I don't assume my reader doesn't know these words. I don't assume that they're going to be stuck or that if they run into a moment that makes them uncomfortable or feels foreign that they're going to abandon the novel i think i assume my readers are are smart and thoughtful and want to know more about themselves and others and if there's something that comes up that they are not sure about uh they'll do the extra work or they'll use context or they'll decide you know maybe it's not that important and like i'm just gonna keep um, in the stream of the story and just keep moving forward. And I think I, I give them that grace and that kind of um, responsibility because I think that's the responsibility that's been placed on me as a writer. I mean, as a reader, there are novels that I read where I won't know um, have the background or the references to fully understand certain things. And I'm someone who enjoys the research and enjoys looking things up. 
Um, and I'm also okay in certain books just saying like, all right, well, I'm going to use context and just assume and keep moving forward until this comes up again and it, it stumbles me or, or not. And so I, I am fine recognizing that certain readers will get stuck and that is not my job to unstick them. They um, will have to make a choice and I offer them the agency to do so. In that frame of thinking about your audience and who you might imagine them to be, you tell often this story about being a teacher in Prince George's County as someone who is a product of the Prince George's County school system. Really appreciated the story about a young student who you were trying to convert into a reader and who posed a challenge to you about where the stories where are the stories about us? Could you tell us that story again? And who are you thinking about that student when when you're writing? You, you know, about supplying those types of uh, reading outlets, the stories about us? Right. So I was uh, a teacher at a predominantly Latinx school, um, almost 80% of, of Latino students. And the majority of them were not on grade level. So although I was teaching eighth grade, um, students were sixth, seventh grade reading level. They were not uh, at the appropriate stage to, to prepare to go to high school. And I had one student in particular who I adored. She was hilarious. Like she was the kind of student that um, real smart at the mouth, right? Like always had some slick to say. Um, but she was not someone who during silent reading time was super interested in the books. Um, and as a reading teacher, that was kind of the goal, right? And for me, I knew that all of the objectives, all of the tests, all of the things that we could throw at a student was not going to prepare them as well as just 10 to 15 minutes of silent reading every day where they just had to sit and focus and work on the skill, right? That is the, you know, the tie, tried and true kids just need to read in order to become better at reading, right? And so I, I kept trying to give her different kinds of books. And at the time, you know, there were a lot of things that were popular, Hunger Games, Divergent, Twilight, and this kid was not with it, right? She's like, I don't care about sparkly vampires. I don't care about kids killing each other for food. Like, this is not for me. And finally I asked her like, well, what is it? What, what would you like? And she said, just like, where are the stories about us, right? And she's a kid growing up in Langley Park, predominantly Salvadoran um, population. Um, born and raised here in, in the U.S. And this, this, her speech is, is, you know, English that is, is accented and is slang and is ebonics and is, um, was not the kind of speech that she was seeing in any of these books. And so I, I thought about it and I went out and I got Julia Alvarez and Jacqueline Woodson, Jacqueline Woodson and, um, Walter Dean Myers and Jason Reynolds and authors that I thought she would really relate to. And within two weeks, this student who had told me she was not a reader, have no interest in that miss, had finished every book I put in front of her, right? And so it became very clear that it was about her entryway into literature. It was about how she saw herself reflected because then she looked at me and is like, all right, what's next? And I'm like, what's next? Like, <laughs> that's it. That's my whole teacher budget. That's all the books. Like, that's all I got. Right. And so it was um, it was this moment that I think really galvanized me to, well, maybe I'm next. Maybe the story that I have to tell and the ways that I relate to my students and come from a very similar background and speak in a very similar way. Maybe I can offer something that um, will. Will answer this question of, of not only what's next, but where are we? And, and I'll say that I was releasing Family Lore yesterday. It launched and I did an event here in Washington, D.C., and there's a teacher that came that teaches at the high school where my middle school, where I taught, would have fed into. So the majority of my students ended up going to this high school, and he told me, you don't know how many students I have who had never finished a book, and then I give them your work, and it it is a doorway to, to other books. And so to answer the second part of your question, although I'm, I'm not in the teaching world anymore. I don't think of those students every time I go to sit down to write. Um, I It is not lost on me, the impact that continue to be really specific about the young people that I think need to be on the page, um, knowing that, that it reaches them and, and allows them to feel seen. Well, shifting from sort of the, your career in, in, in youth literature to 
some of the more adult themes in family war, uh, sex and sexuality. That's something that could be really tricky uh, for a very Latin, very Catholic family. What was writing about that like? <laughs> Listen, I am so nervous about this book coming out in Spanish because I know <laughs> my family is going to have very strong feelings. As someone who did not grow up having any conversations about menstruation, about sex, about relationships in that way, writing this book um, and and those and scenes right sex scenes not just that but also contemplations of of sexuality and of how we discover what what pleasure can be was really difficult and i think to this day it's probably what scares me most about this book that i just know um it's very easy to shun someone who is asking questions about why certain cultural norms silence conversations around pleasure and, and what a disservice it does specifically to young women in those cultures. And I know that, that I have family who is going to be very upset at some of the language, at some of the depictions, at, oh, that's not what good girls write about, that's not clean, that's not pure, right? Purity culture is a big deal. And even at my big old age, when my I have a whole kid, I've been married for years, um, I know that it's going to create tension. And and if I've gotten any sleepless nights over this book, it's, it's because of feeling like in order to tell the story I wanted to tell, I had to be really honest about questions of um, sexuality and, and of pleasure. And I refuse to shy away from the ways that uh, subjects are, are silenced. Well, I hope, uh, I hope your family is able to see that and hear that right now and allow you to have more uh, sleep the next couple of weeks. <laughs> um, you've, you've weaved in uh, bits of magic realism in this book, which is a personal favorite of mine. You know, for example, all of the women in the Marte family have a gift. Um, except for the youngest one. Uh, well, her gift comes in another way, right? And of course, this is something that we see throughout Latin American um, literature. Marquez. When you think of your work in the context of either Latin American or U.S. Latino literature, what legacy do you hope to carve out? I'm glad that you pointed that out because I, I think this novel was intentionally trying to be in some of the traditions that we've seen specifically from Latin American writers, right? Laura Esquivel, who wrote Water for Chocolate. Um, you mentioned Marquez, um, Isabel Allende, right? The many ways that folks coming from particular parts of the world turn to magic as a way to create structure and understanding of really complicated times, but also that a lot of us believe in magic, believe in the supernatural. Don't don't think of it as fantasy in the ways that um, American literature contextualizes fantasy, right? As a separate world, as world building. You know, I grew up in a house where your dreams mattered and they meant things and you were gonna play the lotto numbers based off of what you dreamt. And so for me, it didn't seem surprising to write about that, but I did wanna think well, what does Caribbean magical realism sound like? And what does a New York Dominican magical realism look like? And so it is, I think, a little bit funky and a little bit hip hop and a little bit urban and a little bit and a lot of bit Dominican, right? We have someone who can foretell the future through dreams. We have someone who can tell if you're lying. And then we have someone who has a taste for lines where she can make things with lines that, you know, invoke feelings and people of nostalgia. We have someone who has an alpha vagina and, and everything that that means. Like, it's not the, um, it's not your grandmother's magical realism, but it is, right? Like, it's this mix of things. And so I hope my legacy is one where it's, um, how did I carry forth a tradition that I think uh, I've inherited? And, and how did I reinvent it and pass it along just a little bit different with a little bit more spice to you know, the next generation to to do their own with. I love that. I've been thinking about that in my own writing. I knew I do news writing, so I don't know how much magic realism I can incorporate in that. But as a Puerto Rican, I think about it all the time. Right. Um, you you were writing this book while you were pregnant. How did that influence your writing? Ooh, um, 
I had to write in between naps. I was one of those pregnant people who like just never had the energy. They're like, second trimester, you'll get energy. I It never happened for me. I was just exhausted the whole time, but I was on deadline. Um, and so I had to be really mindful of these are my best four hours in the day, right? These are the four hours where I know I'll have the most energy. And I rented an office and I would go in every day and like take myself to work because it, it helped me um, arrive and sit down and feel like, well, now I'm here, I have to do it. And I would just get going. And I think the pregnancy created a certain kind of pressure because I knew one baby was coming in October. There would be no writing after baby got here. And so the book had to be done. Um, but two, my days just felt different. So on a very practical level, I think the pregnancy kind of made me be really mindful of how I was using my time. But but on a on a level of creativity, I think it made me empathetic towards my mom and towards some of the women I was writing about. And I think it made me more empathetic towards myself, that when you realize how precious life is, and especially in those early weeks when you are counting down until things feel a little bit more sure, there's just something that feels so precious about um, how you hold that, you know, if it's, especially if it's a wanted pregnancy. And it, it made me think of how unkind I can be towards myself, and yet knowing that my mother probably felt similarly when she was carrying me, like just how precious I was and how unprecious I treat myself. You know, so there was this real moment of in loving um, the mother I was becoming, I had to to think about how loved I have been and and maybe disregard. There, there was a lot coming up for me. And I think the book, you kind of get those early moments, right? I, I By the time the book was turned in, um, I was, I was still pregnant. I was about to give birth. And so none of the birthing part or the actually being a mother, um, is in this book, but for sure the pregnancy and those sensations and those feelings and being very sensitive to smell, like all of that kind of wove itself into the narrative. Well, no, certainly there's that one passage where Flor talks about like, how in her life she always felt like she was a host in her own body and she didn't feel fully human until she was pregnant with her daughter, right? right. Like that certainly sounds like what you're talking about right now. For sure. <laughs> I wrote that passage after walking by a fish market and being like, oh my God, it smells so bad. And also being like, wow, my nose is amazing. Like this is like a supernatural power to be pregnant. Like I've never smelled in this way. <laughs> and so the duality of like, oh, it's attacking me. And also how amazing that like, you know, I, I, I thought I knew myself and I'm now in this whole different part of my, of my life and of my body because of, of this kid. So it was very wild to be writing while experiencing the world differently. Well, you are also a champion slam poet, and last year the Poetry Foundation named you the 2022 Young People's Poet Laureate. In what way has being a poet shaped your fiction work, your prose? I love this question because I think uh, poets are often considered meandering novelists. <laughs> like a lot of poets who become novelists tend to be more interested in, in descriptions and images, and I, I think that is true for me. But I will say that um, I find that I'm really mindful of prosody. I'm very thoughtful about rhythm and the music of language and the ways that having a really long sentence without a lot of punctuation creates momentum. And if the character is in a, in a moment where they're feeling chaotic, where I want to invoke that in the reader, um, maybe having that kind of sentence makes sense. So. I think there is a technical aspect of poetry that lends itself really well to to writing writing novels that I imagine my prose counterparts would really benefit from studying poetry and, and thinking through how poets manipulate language in order to um, affect right affect audiences that isn't just about the words but is about the meter is about um, the ways that it looks on the page is about, um, yeah, the perfect image, as I mentioned. And so 
uh, I find that poetry comes up quite often in, when I'm writing books. For me, there is a draft that is just entirely about is the language beautiful and elevated and, and art is the language art, not just the story. Well, certainly several times in the book where I was like reading it with rhythm in my mind and I could see like, oh yeah, there's, there's the meter. There. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, you know, the, the punch uh, in the, so it definitely comes through in the, in the work. What is your hope for the next generation of Latino authors? I hope that folks, um, are really thoughtful about whose lineage they're writing in, right? I think it's important to say the names of the writers who influenced us to not let um, readers forget the the kind of um, paths that we've walked, that folks have walked in order for us to write. And so I hope people are thoughtful about their lineage. And I hope that that writers are just ultra specific about voice, right? That, that there is nothing I think as important as just being singular in your work. Um, I hope no one is trying to write like me or write like Julia or write like Juno. I hope people are really um, dedicated to to all the confluences that make their work what it is and that they, they're they honing what it means to sound exactly like themselves. Um, because I think that's what distinguishes writers and I, I think that's what we've been missing in the canon. It's just um, a lot of different kinds of voices, right? That there are so many Dominican writers and we do not sound alike. And there's so many Latino and, and Latin American writers and they do not sound alike. And so how do we just create uh, a pantheon of the many ways that our experiences can come onto the page? I'm curious, in, in college, I read a book by Gineta Candelario, Black Behind the Ears, which is something that applies to the Dominican Republic as well as to Puerto Rico. Eh, Dime quién es tu abuela, ¿verdad? Um, and so I was curious, at what age uh, did your sort of like awareness of negritude and the complicated relationship that culturally Dominicans have with, with Afro-Latinidad, when did that start developing in you? And at, at what age did you sort of like fully embrace that part of your identity? I feel it, it was it was high school where I began really paying attention to the transatlantic slave trade, right? Which we had learned maybe a little bit about in middle school, but kind of realizing like, oh, those, those ships came here too. I'd always been conscious of race because um, I had this super curly hair and uh, I was darker than some other Dominicans that I knew and lighter than some other Dominicans and kind of had a sense of, um, I would be told, like, put a clothespin on your nose, para que fuera más fino. And, and, you know, I watched a lot of people I knew straining their hair from very young ages. So there was always this um, aspiration towards Eurocentric um, beauty standards that made me very mindful, oh, I am not that. Right, so so race wasn't discussed, but there was clear characteristics, racial char characteristics that um, I was mindful of, even at a you know five, six, seven, right, wanting straight hair, wanting to look like Barbie, wanting a particular body type. But in high school, when I really kind of began thinking about slavery and the impact of slavery, and doing my own research and trying to understand, you know. Who am I? Where do I come from? And asking my parents, you know, what what race are we, right? Because Dominican is the nationality, and Latino is an ethnicity, and Dominican is an ethnicity. But what what is our race? And they're like, no, brown. Like we didn't have language, um, and probably because black was perceived as meaning as being synonymous with African American, right? Black American, African American. But I think black as a racial category did not feel like one that could include um, Afro descendants from the Caribbean. I didn't know that Black could be expansive enough uh, as a racial category to include all folks of African descent. Um, and so I I wasn't really sure, and I think it, it was a barrier of language. And so maybe by the time I got to college and began really taking courses in race and began um, studying different writers and um, for sure, Gineta, um, Silvio Torres Ayan, I'm thinking here, 
um, Ana Lara Maurin, right? Like there's a lot of scholars that were doing the work of languaging race specifically for Dominicans that, that I began kind of understanding like, oh, okay, like Black American is an ethnicity in its own right. Blackness is an umbrella that covers a lot of different folks. The one drop rule in the US is not the same and does not cover or, or is not felt similarly in other places, mestizo, like learning the language of how caste has existed um, in the Caribbean and the Dominican Republic and how it's different than what I learned about caste in the US. And so it's it's juggling a lot of different understandings of the permeability of how race has existed in this country and also um, the barriers and the kinds of confines of race as well. Well, thank you for sharing. I could talk to you all day about <laughs> about this, about your book, but unfortunately, right, we're out of time. Uh, so we'll have to leave it there. Elizabeth Acevedo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure talking with you. Likewise, likewise. And thanks to all of you for joining us. To check out what interviews we have coming up, please head to washingtonpost.live.com to find out more about all of our upcoming programs. I'm Marelis Hernandez. Thanks again.